Um, welcome to um, Grand Rounds today, the November the 2nd. It is election day, so I'm going to use the opportunity to encourage everyone to get out and vote, either uh, uh, if you haven't already, uh, get before you go home. Um, I'm delighted um, to introduce today, however, um, one of our own, my friend Dr. Ram Subramanian. Dr. Subramanian is a professor of medicine and surgery at the Emory University School of Medicine. He is a medical director of liver transplantation and the director of liver critical care services uh, here. His fellowship training, which I actually didn't know until um, preparing for this, um, involved both combined training in pulmonary critical care as well as in gastroenterology and transplant hepatology. And his um, goal was then to focus his clinical and research interests in the field of hepatic critical care and inpatient hepatology, which is what he's done. Over the course of his career as a hepatologist and intensivist, he's developed a specific clinical and research expertise in extracorporeal liver support and hepatic critical care. But recently, um, Dr. Subramanian completed an MBA um, with the goal to apply this knowledge to healthcare delivery and administration. And it was um, really the insights and things that he's learned from that um, that uh, uh, are the reason we asked him to speak with us today. And so um, Ram is going to give a talk on MBA Insights for Healthcare Delivery and Administration. And thanks so much, Ram, for, um, for speaking to us today. Wendy, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. And hopefully, just confirming you can see my screen there, yeah? Looks perfect. Right. So just to recap on the MBA experience, I finished my MBA um, a couple of years ago at Coizueta, and it has changed the way I think about healthcare delivery, healthcare administration. So I, I really appreciate this opportunity to share some thoughts with the audience today on my experience in the journey, and more importantly, how I'm applying this to um, my specific clinical context. But one thing I would request the audience to do is I'm going to talk about models, talk about concepts uh, related to uh, the application of MBA to my specific clinical domain, which is hepatology and liver transplantation. But as you hear these concepts, I would invite you to think about how you could apply these concepts to your specific service line, to your specific program. Um, so with that background, and I have no disclosures, let me, uh, well, let me see if I can advance the slide here. Hmm. Sorry, just give me a moment. I may have to stop sharing and come back again. Looks good. Yeah, for some reason I'm having trouble uh, advancing the slide. Let me just sort of see if I can do this again. You want to email to me? Yeah, let me see if um, I'd, I'd like to sort of scribble on the slides. Um, okay. Oh, here we go. All right. Can you see this? Can you see the slide? No, can you, see, no. you cannot. All right. Sorry, this just working uh, a couple of minutes ago. Always the way it goes. Can you see my desktop now? Yes, yes. All right, let's give this a whirl. Yep. All right, here we go. And hopefully it's advancing for you. All right. So from a outline standpoint, um, number one, just a brief introduction to the MBA curriculum, all the different disciplines. And then drawing parallels to that curriculum to what we underwent in um, medical training. Uh, number two, talking about the business analysis of a given service line, what is the model that we use to 
uh, think about an initial introduction to analyzing any of your service lines. And then I want to get into the uh, process of applying models within those various MBA disciplines to the context of managing uh, a clinical program. And within this context, we'll talk about the concept of strategy, we'll talk about operations, we'll talk about marketing, um, accounting and finances briefly. Um, and so this is, uh, by the way, you know, semester long courses on each of these, but I'll try to capsulize it into uh, 10 minutes each, if you will. And then finally, I want to just finish up with talking uh, about some thoughts about leadership of high functioning teams, uh, which really applies to uh, our medical practice as we interact with some very high functioning individuals. So that'll be the um, sort of the outline for the rest of the talk today. But before I get into that, let me just briefly share with you um, the path to the MBA, just a personal journey. And again, this may be of interest to anyone on the call who is thinking about undergoing some formal training um, in this domain. So I was an economics major undergrad, and so early I got introduced to you know, company efficiency, productivity, and along the way in residency and fellowship, uh, I was constantly thinking about how I could uh, loop it back, if you will, combine that economics training with uh, the medical training. And then as a junior faculty, I was fortunate enough to um, have the opportunity to undergo sort of dedicated physician executive training, um, both within Emory and outside Emory. And especially for the junior faculty on the call, just to draw your attention to the pro lead course, which some of you may be, a lot of you may be familiar with, and I took an older version of it. But that really set the stage for giving me the in initial introduction to concepts um, in this specific domain, and that led to uh, exploring courses outside outside Emory. Um, and every time I took a course, uh, both within and outside Emory, there was a constant urge to learn more. Um, and so as I thought about this for a while, uh, that finally led to a few years ago, um, pursuing a dedicated MBA at Guizueta. And I've sort of put here, and the important part was getting approval from um, my wife, because it was, it was a commitment um, and so just to share with you that uh, it took a lot of support from um, various individuals uh, and importantly my wife to sort of make this happen. So just a sort of a brief blurb on the personal journey, especially for those who um, uh, would be interested in thinking about this um, additional training and a specific uh, um, mention of the pro lead course here. All right, let me sort of talk about the MBA curriculum. So um, we spent semester long courses on, we spoke about strategy, we, talk, we spoke about operations, uh, spent a whole semester on data analytics, which is very interesting. It, there was almost parallels to what we do in biomedical research, especially clinical research. Um, we spent a whole semester on marketing and I had a whole new appreciation for the science uh, behind marketing. And then we got into some of the really, what I thought was the hardest stuff um, from a finance and accounting standpoint, that took me a while to figure out. Um, but now that I've emerged on the other side, I'm very glad I underwent that training just to uh, understand the financial aspects of, uh, of, uh, of a medical practice. And then finally, um, uh, so, so a fair amount of uh, uh, discussion regarding leadership concepts, and I'll share that with you um, as well. So as you look at this, so this is a two-year process, um, and by the way, I've learned that they've shortened the current MBA to, I think, 18 months now. A um, couple of uh, comments here as I reflect back on this MBA journey and drawing in parallels or similarities to medical, uh, medical education. Number one is, uh, at the end of the MBA, or towards the end of the MBA, we had to address a specific business problem. And we were required to bring all these different concepts together to answer a specific uh, business problem for a major advertising company in the US. 
So when I thought about that uh, concept, it sort of reminded me of what we do in medicine, where in medical school we go through, especially the first couple of years, we're learning about biochemistry and uh, physiology and anatomy. But as we graduate to the higher levels of medical school and then eventually to residency, it's about bringing all those pieces, all those different disciplines together to answer a specific clinical problem. And so I saw parallels as far as uh, the way the MBA came together, where you take all the concepts from all these different disciplines and then incorporate them collectively uh, to answer a specific business problem. So that was fascinating to draw the parallel. Number two is the reiteration of the importance of a team approach to problem solving. So we have about 40 um, mid-career individuals in our, in our class and five of us were in healthcare, but, but the, the rest of them from various disciplines. Um, and we were doing uh, group work to, uh, to identify or to address specific problems, but it really emphasized the importance uh, and the strength of, of a team approach to problem solving and learning from each other. I learned as much from my colleagues in class uh, as I learned from the professors. And so that was a very enriching part. And as I think about that experience, it, it re, uh, sort of rekindles what we see in medicine, where as we do our, our multidisciplinary approach to patient care, we are learning from each other um, every day. Um, so just to draw a couple of parallels regarding the MBA experience with uh, what, what I went through, uh, what, we, what I experienced in, in healthcare on a, on a daily basis. So now let me just move on to um, sort of the MBA um, sort of concepts. And the first thing I want to share with the audience is this central, what, I, what I'm defining as a tenet across all MBA courses. Uh, and this re has resonated with me you know, during the MBA and now every day um, as I sort of step into healthcare. And this is the term, value as defined by the customer. And this is something that uh, has become front and center for me as I am sitting in meetings, as I'm analyzing um, clinical problems uh, from a business standpoint. Um, and so just to flush this out a bit more, because this is going to form, uh, I'm going to come back to this theme again and again. So when you think about the customer, and again, think about sort of patient care delivery, this can be, the customer can change depending on the context. So when you think about external, and again, I'm going to start using the liver transplant program as sort of my home base. But again, as, you, as I share this, these concepts with you, please reflect on how this would apply to your specific clinical programs. So when you think about a customer on the external side, I'm thinking about the referring MDs. And so the gastroenterologists and the intensivists and the hospitalists who are referring patients to us for liver transplant. So that is an external customer. A very important customer, as you know, front and center is the patient. How does the patient look at our service line, whether they admitted from the inpatient side or the outpatient side? And a third, and a third example of an external customer would be our payers. So how do our insurance companies view us and, and how do they define customer value? Uh, and so these themes are sort of constantly sort of, uh, I, I play these sort of themes in my, in my mind as I'm thinking through uh, sort of the daily administration of a, of a liver transplant program. Switching the customer to uh, sort of the internal context. Uh, so within Emory Healthcare, you know, who are the uh, important customers and how do they define customer value? And so related services, and, and this context again in the liver transplant world, I think about interventional radiology, I think about pathology, uh, I think about our ICU services. So these are important partners um, and important internal customers that um, I, I think about and make sure that we have a, and a good interaction with. Another important customer, if you were on the internal side, is our administrators, Hel uh, Emory Healthcare Administration. How do we how do they define customer value and how, therefore, how do we um, modify our behavior, if you will, in order to maximize that shared experience? And then finally, uh, you know, the MBA has, has not only affected work, but it's also affected pretty much my personal life. So as I think about on a personal level, as I'm talking to my teenage sons, 
or to my in-laws or my wife, how does, uh, how do you sort of reconfigure the customer in those conversations and how do you uh, define customer value when you're having those specific conversations? So again, this, this theme, this, this concept has really resonated with me and I think it's a very valuable perspective to have um, as you um, enter a conversation, enter a negotiation, um, and define, importantly, how you define your business strategy and your business operations. All right, so sort of moving, sort of keeping that, that concept of customer value front and center, and this is where it becomes very important, and this is almost aha moment sitting in the strategy and operations courses, the importance of aligning customer value with your business strategy and your business operations. So let me just walk you through this. So you define or try to understand customer value really well. And this, and again, the customer could be your external um, referrals, it could be your patients, it could be your payers. So once you really understand that, then you then decide or define what your internal business strategy is going to be. And so this is very important. And we saw cases, multiple cases in the MBA, both healthcare and non-healthcare, where the, the company did not align the company's strategy with customer value and there was a failed business model. So, so it is so important to first really understand what the customer wants, and then you can then define your strategy. And then once you define the strategy, then you define the internal operations. And operations uh, in this model is defined as your resources and your capabilities. How do you align and devote your resources and capabilities so that it uh, aligns with their strategy, which eventually then uh, aligns with your customer value? So this was sort of an important sort of step down model where everything starts with really understanding uh, what the customer values. The second thing that, just to share on this slide, and this is becoming very, very important in the COVID era, uh, and there's a perfect illustration, if you will, is the importance of environmental scanning. Keep watching your environment for any changes that can happen in customer value, because then, if you're agile enough to understand what is happening in environment, you can make timely changes and be nimble enough to change your strategy and change your operations so that you still are able to address that new customer value, if you will. So let's put this in a context and COVID is a perfect example. Um, and I think we did a really good job of understanding and incorporating telemedicine into a strategy and operations across the board in all, all our departments, including the Department of Medicine. So I think that was a perfect example of, of a change in the external environment that necessitated a change in your internal strategy and the internal operations. And so, so just to sort of to reiterate that point, we time and time again, we're sitting in our strategy courses and sitting in our operations courses we were uh, the the importance of understanding customer value number one and number two assessing for changes in customer value was harped on time and time again so i just wanted to sort of share that uh, this uh, this concept with you regarding environmental scanning all right let me now move on to uh, business analysis of a program and, and again i've put this in the context of the liver transplant program but this is the one of the first of many models and it's called the five c model so the five c's on this so what, what what are the five c's number one is context and we already spoke about this that's environmental scanning think about what is happening uh, in the external environment that may influence the context and just to put this in the context of liver transplant, I think as many of you know, recently in the past year, there's been a change in organ donor allocation. A lot of organs are leaving Georgia and going up the Eastern seaboard. And so that is causing a rise uh, in our disease acuity and the, the MEL score in particular at the time of transplant. So that's a good example of, of uh, the, a change in the context and context analysis. The second C in this model, as you analyze your business, your business analysis uh, of your given service line is the company. And by that, what they mean is do a good inventory 
of your core competencies. What, what are your strengths uh, and your potential weaknesses? Um, and so I think for example of this would be, you know, as we analyze the liver transplant program, um, it is well positioned, especially for the, with this dedicated liver intensive care unit, for example, to accommodate high disease acuity. So that's an example of sort of company analysis. Number three, the third C in this model is competitors. And uh, you don't have to look far. So Piedmont is a, is a very good liver transplant program uh, that, is, that is, creates a very competitive market for us. And we also have Mayo Jacksonville and Oshna uh, in our liver transplant space. So that's a, an example of how you would do a, a quick competitor analysis or, uh, of your uh, 5C business model. The, the fourth C in this is customers. Uh, who are your customers? We've already alluded to this before, uh, but you have your patients, but then the gatekeepers, importantly, are your referring MDs who you're dependent on for referrals. And as you analyze these customers, they have what we define as low switching costs, i.e. they can easily switch their referral pattern to Piedmont, for example. And as you analyze the customers, as, as some of you may know, we recently have had a, a successfully secured a dedicated Kaiser contract for liver transplant. And that's an example of analyzing the market and for potential customers uh, to increase out-of-state referrals um, and, to, and to establish dedicated referrals. So that's an example of the customers in this model. And then finally, the, the fifth C in this model is collaborators. And so uh, in the context of uh, hepatology and liver transplant, uh, again, uh, sort of just a repeat of the concept, but your collaborators in this example would be referring MDs and payers. And as you know, importantly in transplant, the payers and CMS in particular are closely watching our transplant outcomes every six months. Um, so just to give you an idea of a useful model um, involving these five C's that gives you a quick analysis of your uh, current state um, as you analyze uh, your business model for your uh, specific service line. So this is something that uh, especially in our strategy uh, course we uh, reviewed multiple cases where we would apply the 5C model um, uh, to get a lay of the land if you will. All right, now let me sort of dive into specific disciplines, if you will, and I'll start with strategy. So this is a, a, a one semester course, but just a few sort of take home messages from this course. So let me start with the definition, and this is a simple definition, a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a specific objective. So that's a pretty generic. But let me share with you another definition that really appealed to me, and I think it appeals uh, it appealed to me in part because it really applies well to a complex service line like liver transplant, but you can extend this to, you know, I think each of your service lines that has intricate um, sort of interplay, if you will. So what this, this definition says is that strategy is a design of interconnected activities and capabilities that creates unique customer value to achieve a sustained competitive advantage. So it's sort of a three-part uh, um, definition, if you will, three components of it. But what, what as you apply this to uh, liver transplantation, uh, as, as you all know, liver transplant is a sort of a unique interplay between many interconnected activities. So we need um, great hepatology, great liver transplant surgery, intensive care, interventional radiology, transplant anesthesiology. Um, so it is um, sort of highlights the, the concept of interconnected activities and capabilities. And, and the trick here from a, for a successful strategy is to have this interplay in such a way that you can have unique customer value. For example, we can take care of sicker liver disease than Piedmont, for example, because we have specialized transplant anesthesia and transplant intensive care. Um, and the goal, the, the, the ideal state is that you create a successful strategy in such a way that you can uh, cre create a, such a unique service line of multidisciplinary service line that cannot be uh, copied by your competition, thereby giving you a sustained competitive advantage. So 
I just wanted to share this definition with you because I think it really uh, encompasses all the components of a successful strategy uh, where you create complexity to a degree um, that cannot be copied by your competition. Having said all that, in that strength lies its weakness. So for example, if suddenly overnight there is a perturbation or a attrition in our IR colleagues or in our intensive care, then that, that this complex system is at risk for um, deterioration. So that's something that sort of keeps me up at night at times is not only watching my immediate liver transplant program, but looking at all the different players uh, within radiology, within inter intensive care, uh, that we rely on in order to maintain this unique competitive advantage that we have. All right, so let me now move on to another tool within strategy. I think a lot of you are familiar with the SWOT analysis, but just to sort of recap on this, this is, a, this is again an exercise we went through at some frequency. Um, so SWOT is for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And so when you think about, so break this down a bit more, Strengths and weaknesses is sort of an internal analysis. And this needs to be an honest analysis. What are you good at? And what are your potential opportunities for improvement, if you will? And so that, that's a sort of an honest analysis uh, from an internal standpoint. From an external standpoint, and that's where your opportunities and threats come along. So what are your potential opportunities um, in the market? And, and what are your potential threats? And COVID was a great example of an external threat that uh, took us all by surprise. So I think you all, a lot of you are familiar with the SWOT analysis, but just to go through that, um, and sort of just the, the details of that. So when you apply this to liver transplant, just to illustrate the concept, so as I think about the SWOT analysis for a liver transplant program, our strengths, our experienced faculty in a great hepatology faculty, for example, dedicated liver intensive care unit with, you know, with excellent intensivists and ICU care providers who understand liver failure. From a weaknesses standpoint, you know, this is something that we get feedback on compared to our competition. Is there an opportunity for us to improve our communication with referring MDs? And then uh, can we improve our access to care, both on the outpatient side and on the inpatient side? So that's that would be examples of uh, sort of weaknesses or opportunities for improvement. And then externally, um, <clears throat> opportunities, an example would be new market share. You know, we are developing an expertise in um, artificial liver support, dedicated liver intensive care. So now we've been able to expand our reach into all our neighboring states um, with a goal to increase our market share. And then finally, threats. Uh, I've already alluded to this before, but there has been a decrease in organ supply because of changes in organ allocation. So that is a definitely a threat. And then this was definitely a clear example uh, of, a, of a threat that affected all our service lines. So that is the uh, SWOT analysis uh, within, within the strategy framework that's a really helpful tool um, to uh, get, an, get a good assessment of the internal and external situation. The second model, if you will, that, that we were introduced to and we analyzed, we applied this to multiple um, business models, if you will, is the Porter's Five Forces. And the, Michael Porter is one of the gurus in strategy. And this is his model. Um, and this is this is this was applied to multiple contexts. But just to run through this, uh, you have five components. Uh, you have industry rivalry. That's number one. Uh, and I'll tease this out more in the context of liver transplant. Number two is threat of entry. Can you have uh, entrance into your market that can affect your market share, for example? Uh, number three is bargaining power of suppliers. So um, I'll put this in the context of liver transplant, but a supplier potentially could be your uh, referring physicians, if you will. And so what, what uh, leverage or negotiating power do they have? The fourth uh, co um, force in this model is bargaining power of buyers. And in the medical context, the buyer uh, obviously would be uh, our insurance companies, if you will. They are the um, eventual buyer of our product. And then finally, uh, the fifth force is a threat of substitute. Is there something that can take, then replace your dedicated service line or your de dedicated 
um, delivery to the patient and uh, further impede your market share. So just to highlight these five forces within sort of the context of liver transplant, uh, industry rivalry stating the obvious in a Piedmont is a fierce competitor. Um, so that's, uh, that's an example of industry rivalry. Threat of entry. So when I look at our liver transplant program, luckily at this stage, it's low. You know, there was occasional chatter of Wellstar partnering with Mayo to come into our liver transplant market, but so far that threat has been low. Supplier power, and I've already alluded to this before, and you can, you can define it whether it's low or high. So I would define uh, supplier power in this liver transplant context as high. Our referring MDs have higher power because they can easily switch their referring uh, practices to Piedmont, um, so that gives them higher supplier power. An example of biopower in this context would be, as I mentioned, um, insurance companies and CMS and private payers. And again, within the concept of uh, context of transplant, they have significant power because we are required to um, report our one-year outcomes and three-year outcomes every six months and they are watching those numbers very closely um, and can easily uh, flag us if we hit a certain, uh, go below a certain threshold. And then finally, an example of the fifth force, the threat of substitutes currently, luckily, uh, you know, there's not many options in the sixth serotic uh, with regard to, um, uh, apart from liver transplantation, I think artificial liver support or bioartificial liver support is is many, many years away, if you will. So currently the threat of substitutes um, in the liver transplant context is low. So just to sort of summarize this slide, a useful model that gives you uh, a insight into all the driving forces within your service line that can affect your market share, affect your productivity, uh, your profitability. Um, and how you can then uh, organize your strategy and your operations to counter all these potential forces uh, in, in a favorable way. So those are a couple of models of strategy, but as you all know, when you think about converting your defined strategy to execution, and I put this as a long era, there's a long journey between the strategy that's defined in our boardrooms and in our meetings and finally getting it to the front lines, if you will. How do you successfully uh, execute a given strategy? And as some of you may know, multiple millions of books have been written about this. Um, the hierarchy of academic healthcare, I think, poses unique problems at times. Um, so this is a work in progress, and you know, we're always thinking of, thinking about um, workarounds, if you will, at times to successfully execute uh, uh, defined strategies. But let me share with you a, you know, a couple of references, and this is the only time we're putting references on in this in this slide deck. The one book that appealed to me and is called Execution by uh, Bossidy and Charon. That um, and the take home messages from this book was. Uh, define the right strategy, i.e. make sure that your strategy is compatible with customer value. Number two, define the right processes. So make sure your, your processes are uh, defined uh, in the right manner to address customer value. And the third thing that this book talks about, which I've come to appreciate more and more uh, in, you know, in my current leadership role, is having the right people. And I think a lot of you would identify with this is it is so important to have the right people in the right positions in order to have a successful conversion of strategy to execution. So um, just a book for those of you interested uh, that might uh, uh, sort of pique your interest here. The second sort of model that was useful to think about this strategy to execution uh, conversion is sort of the four W's and the one H. And so, uh, what do you want to do? Who is going to do it? What is the time frame of this execution? Number four, the why, and I put this in yellow, is I think this is, as I, as I think I reflect on this model, this is becoming more and more and more important, especially as you talk to your teams and try to execute it. Make sure they understand why 
this strategy is so important. And some of you may be familiar with Simon Sinek, who, is a, who speaks a lot about this, is as you try to convert a strategy to execution, make sure that the why of that strategy is really well defined, because then it creates shared value, shared purpose, uh, and a collective motivation to convert that strategy to execution. And then finally, those are the, f the four whys, if you will. Here is the how, and this is the devils in the details, if you will. How do you then successfully create the right processes and have the right people to convert that strategy to execution? And then finally, one last reference here, and it's called The Four Disciplines of Execution. Um, and this book talks about, you know, you have a lot of, lot of potential goals, a lot of uh, potential strategies, but make sure you prioritize your goals. Figure out what is really crucial that you want to achieve in the next X number of months and then deprioritize others. It talks about, and I think this is becoming, I found this uh, very helpful, is focusing on lead indicators. Don't wait for the end as far as lag indicators, but think about your lead indicators. For example, when I think about liver transplant, one of the things we measured on is number of transplants because that converts uh, directly into dollars and uh, profit, if you will. But an example of a lead indicator that, that, is, uh, that, is, that precedes the number of transplants is what is your referral pattern and what is your referrals per month. And so that would be a good example of focusing on the lead indicators importantly rather than waiting retrospectively to analyze your lag indicators. And then the, the other thing that the book talks about is maintaining a compelling scoreboard, i.e. make sure that everybody has real-time updates of, uh, as a group of how we are doing as a group. And at that, the book talks about is, is to create a collective purpose and a real-time update um, so that they can see where they're at with regard to achieving the goals. And then finally, this book talks about a cadence of accountability. Um, and this is about mutual accountability. Once you create that shared purpose, uh, create a collective accountability where each of us in a group or in a system is accountable to each other in order to achieve the strategy to execution conversion. And this is something where I think um, in a week we have an opportunity for improvement. How, uh, and this is sometimes challenging, how do you maintain accountability amongst the whole group and create that shared purpose so that everybody holds uh, each other mutually accountable. All right, so um, that's sort of my thoughts on the strategy to execution conversion, if you will. Challenging uh, at times, but uh, hopefully, uh, especially if you check out a couple of these books, you may get some uh, additional ideas. All right, as I'm sort of winding up on strategy, uh, let me just sort of share with you another a concept that really appealed to me, and this is how uh, this is about relating strategy to the balanced scorecard. I think a lot of you on the call are familiar with the balanced scorecard, sort of four components to it as you analyze uh, and define your goals. So number one is the customer relationship, and so this, this applies to patient care, patient satisfaction. Um, the second thing that obviously we look at is our financial metrics. How are we doing on the income statement, on the balance sheet? Uh, so that's the, the obvious second uh, indicator of our, of our functioning. The, the other two components of this is, number three is internal processes. How good are your internal processes, especially as they relate to customer uh, relationship? And the fourth thing that I've wanted to highlight, and I think a lot of you on this call, I think identify with this, is how do you develop your, your colleagues and your team? And that's about internal growth, internal education. How do you invest in them uh, and improve their capabilities and their skill sets? So this is sort of the balanced scorecard that is a very useful sort of four-step process as you define your vision and your strategy. The, in relation to the balanced scorecard, the concept that I got introduced to was what's called the strategy map. And this really appealed to me, and I want to share this with you. What this says, and I'll apply this, this is a sort of a manufacturing company example. But again, you see the same concepts. You see financial, customer value, internal processes, and learning and growth. 
But the, the useful construct here is as follows, is that one investing in one specific domain leads to a positive gain in another. And so let me just walk you through this. If you invest in uh, the capabilities and the skill sets of your team, and then couple that with um, good internal processes um, uh, with regard to patient care, then that automatically will result in improved customer value, improved press gainy scores. And then finally, if you got these three right, the money will flow, if you will, and you will improve your market share, you will improve um, uh, revenue generation, profit generation. So it was sort of an interesting story where the balance scorecard got connected with defining your strategy, where there was a, a link, if you will, between the four, four domains of the balance scorecard where uh, once you get a couple of those uh, processes right, then the, the rest of them will, will follow, if you will. So you don't have to s sort of keep focusing on your financial metrics if you get um, the, the first two processes right. So I, th I thought this was a very sort of interesting sort of story as far as linking um, uh, and focusing your energy into specific uh, sort of domains within the balance scorecard. All right, let me, let me switch gears again and talk about operations, because that was all strategy. So operations is, again, starting with the definition, a set of processes to convert a set of inputs into an output of customer value. So that's sort of stating the obvious here. And putting this in a sort of a um, flow diagram, here are your inputs. You have the classic patients, uh, your inputs, equipment, labor, that's us, and capital. You put that through a transforming process, and that's the operations, and then you have an output. And so in the context of liver transplant, this would be a transplanted patient and the post-operative care. So that is a sort of a simplistic way of, of the operations module, if you will, that went for a, for a semester. But the one, just to share with you an interesting concept regarding feedback, and we spoke about uh, sort of two feedback loops. And the first was, once you look at your output, if your output is not to your desired value, how do you then re, uh, reimagine your operations in order to achieve the desired output? For example, if our transplant outcomes are suffering, how do we look at our internal processes in order to um, achieve the desired output? The number two was, looking at your operations and then looking at changes in your input that would require a change in the operations. So what do I mean by that? And COVID is a great example. Here was an example where your inputs changed. Suddenly you had, you didn't have direct access to patients, so you had to change your operations in order to incorporate tele telemedicine. So this, uh, I think that is a perfect example of a feedback loop where you have to modify your operations in order to accommodate a change in the phenotype of the inputs. So I just wanted to share sort of that concept with you regarding uh, the use of sort of continuous feedback loops as you relate the, two, the three components in this schematic. The other thing we sp uh, spoke about in operations planning, and a lot, some of you may be familiar with this, is process maps. And so mapping out the, uh, the, the customer value, and we spoke about the, so the customer journey map. And as you relate this to healthcare, I think it's useful to think about the patient journey map. And I'll give you an example of what we've done within sort of liver inpatient care that, uh, that may apply to optimizing the process map, if you will. But this is something we did for a lot of industries as far as defining uh, the process map in order to improve operations. So let me put this in the context of liver transplant again. So imagine you have a patient with decomposition cirrhosis, uh, you get a referral or a transfer request, you then uh, ideally create access to care, and this could be inpatient transfer or it could be outpatient referral. And then you stabilize them, work them up for transplant, eventually, hopefully, convert that to a liver transplant, and then you have the post-transplant care phase. So just to give you an idea of a mapping process where you define the patient journey uh, for a given service line. And so as I think about what we've achieved uh, in inpatient liver care at Emory over the past many years, uh, it may be an example of a way to improve the, the patient flow. 
Um, and again, as you think about this, I would think about your specific clinical context and how this would uh, sort of uh, apply to your specific uh, clinical programs. So let me give you uh, an example of the pre-state. So let me call this a traditional care model. And imagine again, a cirrhotic inpatient journey map. And just to walk you through this schematic. So let's assume you have a sick cirrhotic coming through the emergency department with variceal bleeding, with hepatorenal syndrome, uh, with SBP. And they find themselves in some undifferentiated inpatient uh, non-ICU floor. Um, and then they get sick. They develop hypotension, they develop a respiratory failure, and then you're scrambling, if you will, to find an ICU bed. And then you can look for a you know, medical ICU bed. Oh, there's no beds here. You can look, then you switch to a CCU bed. And so then you have a bit of a scramble with different uh, sort of phenotypes of intensive care providers trying to provide specialized care to a really sick liver patient who could be easily going into multi-organ failure. So already you can start seeing the problems from a patient value perspective and patient care perspective regarding this model. Extending this traditional model a bit more, if the patient gets stabilized and eventually finds their way to the operating room for a liver transplant, they get their liver, but then they, they end up, they almost re-zero re the whole patient care experience and send them to a whole new uh, floor that has not seen them before. Uh, an ICU in particular could be a surgical ICU, uh, which has no knowledge of what happened in this complex patient in the preface. And then eventually they make it out of here, they go to a new non-ICU inpatient floor, which again will be new providers, new team. Um, so you can see the, um, the, the potential limitations of this model with regard to lack of information transfer, a breakdown in patient care, uh, a, break, uh, a decrease in patient outcomes from a morbidity and a mortality standpoint. So as you think about process improvement and operations, this is the Emory model, right? So what we have done is that we have created a dedicated liver ICU. So if you have a patient from the ED, uh, there is a default uh, with, with liver disease, they have a default ICU that they will go to and ideally have a bed. Again, there's always limitations to this model, but at least you have a potential designated liver ICU that has dedicated liver intensive care experience. Uh, from a both pre-phase and a post-phase. If they get they stabilize uh, from an ICU standpoint, they go to a dedicated inpatient non-ICU floor that again is a mirror image of the liver ICU from a uh, patient uh, from a care provider expertise standpoint. And the other thing that has really uh, I think helped us in our experiences, and I've put a bi-directional arrow here. Once they go to the operating room for a transplant, and you can imagine that six cirrhotic and multi-organ failure. After getting the transplant, they come back to that same bed and the same nursing staff and the same intensive care providers that saw them before transplant. And so they're uniquely poised to take care of what's coming out of the operating room. And I share this model with you because it, as I reflect on optimizing the patient journey uh, and customer value, I think this model has really uh, helped us and illustrates how you can modify and change the care delivery model uh, in order to optimize um, patient outcomes. So just to put this in a few words, I think this is, a, this is an example of a disease specific approach to care delivery uh, with the same ICU and same floor teams, um, taking care of both the pre and the post phases of care. Just to put this in sort of in a um, indicator standpoint, we have some of the best outcomes in the history of our liver transplant program, despite transplanting sicker and sicker patients. Um, what this has also led to is some very useful sort of cross fertilization between care providers. So we have uh, APPs, fellows, residents, uh, sort of sharing knowledge between the ICU and the non ICU floors. And that has created a whole uh, new opportunity to create new provider skill sets. So for example, our nursing colleagues in this dedicated liver ICU uh, are easily able to take care of both that variceal blade with a Blakemore tube and, and equally comfortable taking care of the post-transplant patient with complex strains and uh, post-transplant issues. So it's created a whole new paradigm of care that actually other centers are trying to emulate. 
And then just to sort of step back a little bit, as I think about this journey um, and breaking traditional silos uh, in uh, compared to other academic centers, it has been helpful to have institutional support and center support, support and, and sort of two specific uh, centers here would be the Emory Center for Critical Care uh, that gave us the opportunity to create such a model and also the Emory Transplant Center uh, that coupled and collaborated well with the Critical Care Center to uh, remove these departmental silos and think about a model that would truly optimize the patient care experience. All right, so let me, I'm just looking at the clock here. Uh, I think I'm about five, ten minutes. So let me just sort of zip through this one for the sake of time. Um, just to finish up on operations, I think you're all familiar with lean management, so I won't belabor that point. We went over that. We spoke about Six Sigma, which is a way to minimize defects. We spoke about you know, theory of constraints, basically identifying bottlenecks, if you will, in the system. And then we also spoke about, you may be familiar with failure mode and effects analysis, but it's basically imagining different scenarios. What would happen if the COVID epidemic took over 80% of our ICU beds? That would be a good example of, of sort of scenario analysis to start planning for uh, potential uh, um, sort of scenarios that you have to deal with. Let me just move on to uh, marketing, and um, and I, I learned a new noun. It's called the marketeer, and um, we spent a semester on this. But it's about creating, importantly, communicating and delivering value to the customer. And again, here I want to share with you a very uh, sort of a uh, very useful model that resonated with me. It's another another C model, but it's called a three C model, and this is basically it's a Venn diagram. Uh, that has the three C's. So you, uh, and this is a very useful exercise for those of you interested. So you, on the first C is the company, that's you. The second C is the customer. And the third C is the competition. And as you draw this Venn diagram and make them intersect, you then start looking at uh, the points of intersection. And here is where you have your competitive advantage, where you overlap with the customer, but the competition is out of this frame. Um, and so an example of this may be that dedicated liver intensive care unit. Where all three intersect is basically that area of intense rivalry where you will compete forever. And here is the competitor's advantage, i.e. The, the something that the competition is, is offering that you are not. And that, for example, could be in the liver transplant world, maybe they are, they are communicating better with our, with our referring docs, if you will. So that would be an example of competitive advantage. So as you think about this model, the goal is to maximize this area and minimize this area. And so it's a useful exercise as you draw these three circles and then start identifying specific uh, ingredients in each of those boxes in order to uh, maximize your, your marketing efforts, if you will. One of the model in the marketing section is what's called the STP model. And this may apply to many of your service lines, especially if you are accessing both inpatients and outpatients for your service lines. But what this talks about is looking at your potential customer base and then using this model where you segment them first, look at all the different phenotypes of the customers. And then based on your specific expertise, which of those segments can you target successfully? And I'll put this in a liver transplant context very soon. And then finally, once you target them, what is your specific positioning within those specific targets? So let me just sort of walk you through this. Segmentation, when I look at all the potential outside providers that can refer to a liver transplant program, we traditionally think of GI, but now as our patients are getting sicker and sicker, we're looking at hospital medicine, we're looking at ICU providers, looking at EM, and rarely you know, PCPs. So you've suddenly expanded the potential customer base, if you will, or referring docs. And once you segment, then you start targeting. And basically you eliminate PCP because they will typically refer to the GI. So then you're left with these four. Um, but then when you talk about positioning, and this has helped us think through our liver transplant program, how these four separate uh, segments will define value is different. So the GI doc may say, I want my patient to be e have easy access, for example, to the outpatient clinic, your transplant clinic. So that is a separate sort of a strategy. However, HMS, ICU, and emergency medicine would say, 
I want easy access to your inpatient units and to your ICU. So that is a conversation with our transfer service, with our ICU docs. So it has been a useful construct to think through how we market our program by segmenting our customer base and then aligning our internal processes in order to serve those different segments the best. So I just wanted to share the STB model with you as well. Um, <clears throat> I see we are short on time. I hope I can just go over five minutes, but just a brief um, thoughts on accounting and finance. Um, I won't bore you with the details of this one, but just to let you know, and I'm gonna summarize this slide by saying that if you, were, if you embark on this journey of, of, of physician executive training, it is, I would highly recommend getting the basics of financial intelligence regarding our service lines. Um, and ha in order to, number one, help you with decision making, and number two, importantly, communicating with our healthcare administrators. It is very helpful when you can bring some of that financial knowledge to the table as you have, as you create shared value with our healthcare administrators. And just to put this in a sort of an equation, so when you think about profits, you think about revenue minus cost. And just to break this down a bit more, revenue is basically price times quantity, and then the cost is there. So as we transition from a fee for service to a pay for performance model, your price is coming down. CMS is cutting down on all our service line reimbursements. And so as the prices come down, in order to maintain our revenue, we are required, not required, but requested to increase our quantity. And so in the liver transplant world, it is nice to increase your liver transplant volume, if you will. And so just to mention that as you, as you think about this, and I hope uh, as we transition to Epic, we can do a better job of this. As we think about QI initiatives, I really think it'll be helpful to see how our uh, uh, improvements and processes help uh, our cost because I think it's uh, as you can imagine in our complex healthcare world it is hard to estimate the cost of a given service line and this is something I've been struggling with in liver transplant as well to truly understand how our process improvements are making a difference I think it'll be really helpful to understand the cost side of this equation uh, moving forward uh, I'm going to skip that for the sake of time but um, and then lastly, I just want to quickly touch base on leadership, and then this will be the last slide. Um, we spent a fair amount of time talking about leadership, and we have a lot, we had many adjectives talking about what defines a good leader. We spoke about authenticity, integrity, uh, being inspirational, visionary. But this is something I wanted to show to share with you. It is a quote from the dean of the Harvard Business School, who's, who talks a lot about leadership. And he was asked, how does he define a good leader? And I still remember hearing this statement on the, on the TV, but he basically said a leader is judged by the people that he or she leads. Um, and if they report being better off under that leadership, then that is good leadership. And it's a very simple, yet I think a very profound statement about if you are in a leadership position, please look and keep your pulse on the team for feedback, whether, because you are defined by the people you lead. Um, and so almost the concept of the, ser of, the, of the servant leader, if you will. And a couple of the thoughts that um, I want to share with you from, especially in the healthcare domain, we have a lot of high functioning folks in our system. And so one thing that was, that is, um, just want to share with you is make a, con a sort of a conscious effort to identify the strengths of each individual in the team. Because I think you have, we have a lot of smart people that, and the goal is to bring all that talent together to execute a shared goal. Um, the importance of listening, we, we heard a lot about that. And then lastly, and I'm, a lot of, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is the importance of psychological safety. Create an environment where people feel safe to express their opinions in, for, the, the, for, the, for the good of the, of the collective, if you will. So just a few thoughts regarding uh, leadership, especially of high functioning teams. So just to summarize this, and I'm sorry I've gone overboard, hopefully we'll have time for questions, but just to recap, number one, understand customer value and recognize that it's the main driver of a successful business model. If you get this wrong, then you are sort of heading towards a, a incorrect business model. And once you define that customer value, 
then you define your internal strategy that aligns with the customer value and then you hook your operations onto that strategy we spoke about creating and marketing a unique competencies that then defines your competitive advantage um, the importance of developing some financial intelligence in order to make smart decisions regarding resource allocation and your communication with your administrators and then finally um, just some thoughts regarding leadership thank you for your attention i'm sorry i went overboard i uh over time <clears throat> and I, I hope i have some uh time for questions or comments um thank you so much from i think we'll take a couple minutes for questions but like we said we are over but um shanti uh, feel free to unmute you and ask your question so congratulations, Ram, on your liver ICU model, and thank you for a very nice presentation today. My question is oh, related to one, you know, you brought up the concept of lead indicators, and you talked about the referral pattern as being one of the lead indicators. I was curious, where do you get, what kind of databases do you get that information from? And do you foresee in the future, maybe using artificial intelligence or some machine learning capability to kind of predict that and use that uh, in the future. Shanti, thank you for that question. So, so for the liver transplant program, we are actually tracking uh, referrals every month. So we, we basically sit down as a group with our outreach team, uh, with our case managers, and we look at our referral volumes every, every month. And then we also look at what percent of those referrals are getting converted to transplants. So that is something that we are consciously doing. We actually have a software embedded into our system for the whole transplant center that lets us capture that data on an accurate basis. Going back to the second part of your question, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think it's something to explore. I think we have the right investment in informatics within the transplant center that will hopefully let us do that. But that's something that definitely, uh, I think you bring up a very interesting point about it, the application of AI to um, predict, even predict market share, if you will. Thank you. Great. I'm going to ask you one very quick question, and then I think we will have to close. Um, obviously, this has benefited you a lot, this training, and given you a perspective to look at clinical operations. Uh, I'm curious, uh, and I'm, I'm you know, betting that you advocate for other people to do this. I'm curious, at what level would you do this? Like, you know, some of our med students get MD, MBAs, or should you try and bake this into fellowship? Or is this something that is after you practiced a while that you really reap the benefits because you have a, a different perspective? And I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, thank you for that. No, I, I think based on my experience, um, you know, one thing that really helped me sitting in that MBA class was to have something to apply to real time. So I think coming into the MBA with some work experience is helpful because it creates a context and brings those bookish concepts alive if you have something to apply it to. So I would lean more towards waiting to undergo this training till you have a few years of clinical service under your belt so that then you have a context and an understanding and a, and a, and a, and a context to apply the concepts to. So that would be my perspective on that. Sense. All right, well, thanks everyone for sticking around for some extra time. Thank you so much, Ram, for that uh, really uh, exciting presentation. It really helps us, I think, again, think differently about our practices. And thank you again for having me. Absolutely.